Hey everyone and welcome to Screams After Midnight. I am Peter, that is Tim, and we talk about horror movies on this show. And it's been a frightful journey to get this episode to you. <laughs> because we, 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 this should have been up two days ago from whenever you are watching this. However, uh, technical issues uh, sort of appeared out of nowhere. And uh, we had to reschedule twice, in fact, to get to this. Mm -hmm. So we're here, though. Uh, it's funny because we, we had planned so meticulously. Because Tim was away on vacation for a week. And we <laughs> planned so far in advance that we had everything set up so that you at home would never feel the absence. You at home would never notice mm -hmm. that it was gone. But then we had technical issues on his first episode back. And as a result, it feels like, you know, it feels like there was an impact. It feels like stuff was missing for a little bit. But a little. Oh, yeah. Here we are. But we but we would never leave you. We're 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 back, baby. <laughs> uh, we're just gone for a few days. Relax. It's all cool now. Actually, I don't know how to respond to that. I was, I was, I was going to say I don't know how to respond to that. I do have respond. I I have I have exclusive exclusive imagery of Tim's vacation for people at home. Oh. <laughs> I have exclusive, an exclusive look behind the scenes at what Tim does when he's on vacation. I hope you're prepared, because here it is. Here's Tim. Oh, hi. <laughs> here see. he is right now. <laughs> that, that's just Tim. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on all fours. <laughs> with what appears to be a goat raiding him <laughs> on his back. Oh, I, I'm sorry. What's your definition of the greatest vacation ever? It's not that. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's not that. And I'm very disappointed I did not get to meet Black Phillip, but <laughs> hopefully someday. <laughs> uh, so what are we talking about then? We talk about horror movies on this show, don't we? Um, Pass Past in the present, indeed. Uh, well, this one's timely, although it's not as timely as it would have been had we done it two days ago. But we're going to talk about The Mist, which, of course, is uh, the Frank Darabont film based on a book by Stephen King. It is now 10 years old. It came out in 2007. I know, uh, makes me feel old. I agree. I was in college. <laughs> that was my last year of high school, Tim. Jesus. I know. Uh, <laughs> so, what, 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 man, it's been 10 years since I finished high school. Damn. Uh, but so you know it's a simple enough plot mist rolls into town there's monsters in the mist group of characters hold up in a supermarket and they have to sort of fend things off and that's kind of the gist of it that's the thing uh, we'll start spoiler free as we always do of course the reason why we're doing this movie is because the tv show is starting this week in fact should all things go to plan we should be reviewing this me and tim not me and connor uh Slight difference here. Horror TV show. We thought uh, we'd get Tim on board for this one. Mm -hmm. We should be reviewing this later on this same night as we record. Which <laughs> one will go up first? I'm not entirely sure yet. They'll probably just go up pretty much back to back. Uh, mm -hmm. That's assuming things go to plans. Mm. That's assuming. Let's dare God to laugh at us by making a plan. Oh, God. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I just, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean... <laughs> Tim... Yeah, that feels like a stupid question because I know the answer. But do do, do you like the mist? Do, do do you enjoy rewatching it? Yeah, uh, I I really really like this movie. Um, I have a tiny complaint. I'm oh. assuming you'll probably have it as well. But, oh okay, um, I'm intrigued. But no, other than that, I think it still holds up pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's a fantastic film. I loved it when it came out. I still love it. I think it's. Uh, I think it's fascinating that, you know, Frank Darabont, after directing two fantastic, like, the, easily the two best Stephen King adaptations, which were, <laughs> ironically, both not horror movies. That that was the thing, like, Stephen King known for his horror, but the two best movies that came from his work were both sort of really emotional dramas, you know, it was Shawshank and Green Mile. In fact, they were both prison movies, which was weird. <laughs> I don't know how that <laughs> happened, but it did. Uh, but here's Frank Darabont did another movie and from Stephen King, and it's it's another fantastic film. It's great. It's, it, it's, it's kind of like a homage to B-movies in the 1950s, but at the same time, it also has a lot to say. There's, like, character depth, there's themes, there's lots of things going on. Uh, I, I feel like it's almost... Um... 
it's it's very Night of the Living Dead esque, like where you know it's a very simple premise um, mm. that you know is really a way to kind of get you know a group of characters together trapped in one place, and then you kind of just really see like humanity emerge from them and the different kind of paths uh, oh, that yeah. it can take. It's it's absolutely pure unadulterated social commentary. That that is <laughs> the entire thing. It's yeah, there's monsters and that's fun, but what the movie's really about is about the characters in the in the supermarket and them, the, the, just the different type of factions that emerge, how they deal with the stress, how they cope in a crisis, all these things. That's what the movie's really about. But that said, if you're here for just like a, a fun monster movie, you also get that. Totally. That, yeah. that said, the ending, which we'll not spoil until we get to spoilers, will probably come as a bit of a shock if you're just here for a fun monster movie. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I really like it. And the ending does stick with you. The ending is fantastic. Uh, really good, interesting mix of characters. Uh, a lot of really reliable character actors. Uh, William Sadler's in the movie. He, of course, was in the other two Frank Darabont, uh, Stephen King movies. He's popped up in a lot of things. He, he's currently the president of Marvel, uh, not the company, he's the president of the US in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, to clarify what I meant by that. Yeah. Uh, Toby now, Jones is there. So. Yeah, and then uh, we'll kind of mix in what you're saying like with Frank Darabont and the character actors and everything. One thing that I think is really impressive, um, and, and I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty big fan of uh, Stephen King. Um, I've read a good amount of his books, uh, not nearly as much as I want to. Uh, you know, he has such a you know wide uh, array of works. But oh, yeah, the man pumps out about five books a year, so, <laughs> and he's been doing it for like 40 of them, so yeah. uh, it's basically a full-time job. You almost spend as much time reading his books as he does writing them, yeah. if you'd read all of them. <laughs> but uh, I feel like he has a very specific, um, like, character touches uh and especially like when it comes to dialogue and i feel like uh in a lot of other movies they don't really nail it and if you don't completely nail it it feels really cheesy but i think frank darabont does such a good job of you know getting the right actors and directing them uh so that they can say these kind of like you know small town folk kind of you know sayings and I, I, way of speaking that works I really well I actually, I'd compare that to, uh, not to bring up uh, the creator of the hit television show Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, <laughs> when it's unnecessary, but I would kind of compare that to Josh Whedon's dialogue where anytime someone sure. else directs his dialogue, it like, go back and watch that first X-Men movie and listen to Storm <laughs> say, what happens to a toad when it's struck by lightning? The same thing <laughs> as everything else. Like, <laughs> that line does not work because, you know, Brian Singer, whoever, uh, mm -hmm obviously Halle Berry, like, no one involved understood how that was supposed to be said. Now, maybe maybe that line is bad, and maybe that's the kind of thing that would have went in a redraft or whatever, but, like, Joss Whedon has all this really quirky dialogue and all of his stuff, and some people hear it, I love it. Uh, oh, but yeah. when anyone else tries to direct some of his things, it tends to kind of come out weird and just sound off and not, like, you know, the tone's just not quite there. Uh, yeah. So I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. I feel like if if you want an example, just like watch this back to back with Dreamcatcher, and it's kind of like, uh... I've not had the pleasure, Tim. Oh, oh, well, we gotta change that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the monsters themselves are pretty cool. Uh, I like how it teases them, and then you get more reveals of them as it goes on. Uh, the mist mm -hmm. itself is a really fun idea. That you know, there's shots of people walking out into the mist, and it's proper, just proper it's creepy cool visual. Yeah. yeah. Uh, occasionally, the, you know, the mist occasionally has a bit of a, you know, it's like, oh, this feels a bit CG uh, here or there, but it, it, it's never too that, obtrusive. That was going to be, like, my one complaint, is I feel like the CGI, I feel at the time when it came out, I thought it looked great, but uh, it, it's definitely worn a little bit. Like, it's not bad. Like, it's not like when you watch, you know, something from, like, 99 or 2000. Like, it, it's not that awful, but... Yeah, it was, a, it was a little much. <laughs> um, I, it's funny because actually one of the things I hate the most about CG is fake smoke. Or, or, okay. or not, not smoke, actually. I should be more specific. It's, mist is actually probably a more accurate thing to what I don't like. It's when there's supposed to just be a thin layer of it. It looks mm -hmm. really bad to me because it doesn't feel like they're walking through it. I think this does a better job of it than a lot. I've seen a lot of other things do. A lot more recent things as well. 
Well, the, um, the, the mist itself it didn't bother me that much. It was more like the, some of the tentacles and stuff, I thought. All right, okay. Didn't age super well. All right, okay. I, I, can, see, I can see what you mean. Um, honestly, it's funny because comparing it to, again, it's, it's going for that 50s B-movie sci-fi kind of... Not, not so much in uh, quality, but at least mm -hmm. it's homaging them so much that it kind of gets away to, with an extent to... Uh, have kind of almost slightly cheesy effects for some things yeah. uh, and it kind of kind of works for me in that sense that said some of the effects I are really good that. i yeah. think the effects later on in the movie are surprisingly really hold up given what they are honestly it was probably just that first tentacle scene that looked a little off to me the other stuff like with the bugs and then when you get the big guys uh you know towards the end uh i, I thought those looked fine but yeah um maybe because those tentacles like when they were coming out you actually see them like Close up. you know it's not yeah it's not like frantic or shrouded in the mist uh maybe that helps it but and again this is just a minor quibble like it's you know we've definitely seen a, a lot worse uh cgi that doesn't hold up um and it's just one of those things that's like ah, it's just a little bit of a smidge on a like really really good movie yeah um no, it didn't really bother me, honestly. Uh, like I, I did notice it. Like I, I wasn't like, oh man, I'm watching Dawn of the Apes uh, with this level of CG. I didn't feel like that, but it, it never, it never stuck out enough to me where I was like, oh, I'm, it's taking me out of the the moment. I guess. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Bye. Hey. Uh, so no, um, it's really good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I was basically all I, want, all I want to say before I get to spoilers. I, I think it's probably worth us diving right in to okay. the uh this full spoilers then for the mist so <laughs> <laughs> let's start with the ending because i feel like it's, it's, the, it's the elephant in the room okay. that everyone's going to want to hear us talk about let's do it <laughs> is the ending i i love the ending i love the music as well that's playing because mm -hmm. as soon as they get away as soon as our main group of characters leave in that car or at least the ones who survived the trip to the car because two or three of them get killed on the way there because uh, mm. that's one of the things that I really like about the movie is is, is it really as much as there's like you know 40 50 people in the store mm -hmm. there's a core group of about seven or eight that feel mm -hmm. like our main group and they, they mm -hmm. kind of bond to the point where you think you feel like yeah they, they've, they've all got each other's backs they want to get out and they're recognizing the rest of the crowd is going a bit crazy and batty they want to get away so they get to the car and they're, they're, they're driving around and they go back to uh the main character's house, uh, David's house, played by Thomas Jane, uh, because his wife was there. Like, they left, him and his son left his wife at home, and she's, like, cocooned up in the, the, the house, and it's like, oh, right, okay, she's dead. Uh, and then they just drive as far as the gas they've got in the car will take them, and hopefully drive out of the mist, which doesn't happen. <laughs> and they're in the car, they, they have a gun with four bullets, and there's five of them, and Thomas Jane's character shoots the rest of them including his own son who's like i don't know eight ten years old whatever age he is L little little kid <laughs> yeah and uh you know laurie holden's character amanda and the uh the two old characters uh, one of whom's also a frank darabont regular uh jeffrey damon who plays dan uh he he, he was in shawshank I, I can't remember if he was in green mile but he was definitely in shawshank and i think there was a couple of characters i recognized from uh the walking dead as well Oh yeah, uh, Laurie Holton's from Walking Dead, as yeah. is the woman the, the, who, at the beginning. Yeah, the woman who leaves early on. Yeah, yeah, they're they're both in Walking Dead. Uh, in fact, actually, so is uh, uh, what's his face? I just mentioned him, <laughs> um, Jeffrey Demon. He's in Walking Dead as well. Although he left quite quickly as soon as Frank Darabont left Walking Dead. Uh, oh right, yeah. Uh, if you, if you hadn't hadn't noticed that, uh, but you could <laughs> tell a lot of them got those parts in Walking Dead because they knew him from this. Yeah, and then Frank Darabont had creative disputes with AMC, and that all disintegrated, mm -hmm. uh, and the show became what it is, which is not very good. So he basically like metaphorically shot all all his actors to save them from the giant looming monster that is AMC. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so he he shoots everyone else in the car, and he's left on his own, and it's a really emotional moment because he because the music stopped at this point, it's mm -hmm. just silence. Uh, and he tries to... He, he puts the gun in his mouth and he clicks it multiple times. He pulls the trigger repeatedly, 
hoping that it'll kill him because he's got no bullets left and he's desperately wants to die. So he eventually just gets out, gets out of the car and he's like, right, come on, kill me. You know, he's, he's the Schwarzenegger from Predator. He's like, I'm right here, kill me. I'm right here, come on, kill me. <laughs> right? He's basically doing that. And he hears rumblings and we think it's more monsters because obviously there was that great shot uh, when they were driving of the giant monster walking mm-hmm. walking across the road. And um, we see that's where the tentacles were coming from. It, the tentacles come down from its stomach. Uh, yeah. But it's just this giant behemoth of a thing. And it's just this beautiful shot. It's kind of like, despite the fact that they've went through this horror and despite the fact that it, this is terrifying, there's almost an insane beauty to how big this thing is. Like, I, I really love oh, that yeah. moment. Um, yeah. But he's waiting. And then then rolls through them. And this is the great thing about having, having missed as your main sort of plot device is that you can have things sort of appear through it. And yeah. a tank appears through. Because all movies have been <laughs> on their own. There's been no no inkling of anyone surviving elsewhere. Like, everyone, like, they, they haven't been able to see any other cars, any other people moving around outside. Uh, mm-hmm. It really feels like it's just them in the supermarket. Yeah. But then this tank rolls through, and it's followed by another, another tank, and then a convoy with the woman who left to get her kids early on and other survivors, and then more tanks, and those guys with flamethrowers killing bugs, and the mist mm-hmm. is actually away. Like, as they're coming through, there's no mist behind them. They're defeating this thing. And mm-hmm. Thomas Jane screams in pain, and the music yeah. comes back in, and it's, it's, it's absolutely gut-wrenching and heartbreaking. He, he killed mm-hmm. his child because he thought yeah. there was no more hope left, and we're left with mm-hmm. this... And uh, I don't like to throw this term out there very often because I feel like it's, you know, overused a lot, but it feels very Lovecraftian. And not just because there's, you know, giant tentacle monsters, but, you know, Lovecraft is, you know, very much about this kind of, like, hopelessness and, you know, mankind not really being able to understand their place in the cosmos. And they're, like, you know, these giant beings that just look at us like, like uh, you know, specks. Um, yeah. And, inconsequential and i feel like it's a first i mean maybe one of the only like horror movies that i can think of that really conveys that emotion of just complete and utter hopelessness you know yeah and obviously the the, the face value monster stuff does add to that whereas like because yeah. we, we hear throughout the movie that the, the military had like a had a research base like nearby up in the mountains it's called project arrowhead and it's implied that it was their fault like whatever they did breached into another dimension and that's where the mist and all the monsters came from which is actually very stranger things now that i think about it um but it's just like that those teases throughout were really funny even though it didn't really matter like ultimately it doesn't really matter where it came from that was just like a fun you know 50s b movie kind of explanation is like, oh the military were experimenting yeah. it was our own fault because that kind of leads me to what i think the movie's really about because and this, this is going to be a really pretentious sounding statement a really sort of film snob kind of remark but you know what th- th- this is true Go in this it. movie it's man that's the monster not the Ooh. monsters <laughs> well th- yeah that's another thing that i i feel like maybe gets tossed around a lot but in this case it is very accurate well i, I think ob- obviously you have the factions and you have the religious nut job and um, missy's carmody Karma- carmody yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, like she she loves this nut job who right from the start is preaching and saying oh this is you know, Old Testament God coming to spite us all because you're a bunch of sinners, blah, 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 blah. Which, honestly, probably one of the best, like, you know, cinematic villains uh, of the last, you know, oh, 10 or yeah. 15 you, years. You hate her guts, like, so quickly. You she, she, you, you want her to die so bad that when she does, you're ready to cheer. It is... And, oh. and you know what I love about it so much? Uh, it's actually something that I really liked about The Witch, Whereas when crazy stuff happens, like, you know, um, the paranoia that came with, like, the Salem witch trials and everything, I I thought the witch did such a a good way of showing that hysteria and how things can get out of control. And just like that, I thought this movie did a great way of showing how a nut job like that can get followers. Like, you know, they make her seem so crazy and stuff at first, but it gives, like... It's possible yeah, well, that they start. <laughs> this, this, this is the thing, and the, the, the whole thing is about when there's a crisis. That's when people start turning back towards something like religion, 
Uh, mm. And this is about as crisis as you can possibly get. <laughs> like, there's those yeah. giant monsters <laughs> coming. It feels like the end of the world. So this mm. nut job slowly throughout the film gains more followers to the point where William Sadler's character, who was dead set against her, until they go for that trip outside to the pharmacy to try and get some supplies. Uh, and yeah. they, they encounter the bugs and the other people who are dying and some of them die when they go there. Mm. And the whole thing, like... That, that shakes him to the point where he's like preaching along with her. He's saying the prayers and they become this angry mob. Uh, it's very much this critique on whenever something does get slightly bad, when, when someone who wants to gain followers uses tragedy to inspire their own their own brand. Like, oh, yeah. we should all, we're all fearing this because these bad things happen. Come with me. My, I have the answers. And in this case, yeah. it's religion. Sometimes it's not, but a lot of times it is. And I think I think that's a very interesting critique of that. And I th- another thing I really want to point out about this movie is that when our main characters, when Thomas Shane and uh, uh, Amanda, uh, that's Laurie Holden's character, when, when our main group of characters, Toby Jones, who's one of the main characters as well, he's the bag boy who kind of becomes a little hero who can shoot. Um, when those characters finally start talking about uh, let's try and make a run for it, even though they know the chances of them getting very far are slim, when they finally start making the, the having conversations about leaving, they have those conversations not because of the monsters, they want to leave because of the other people. It's yeah. the other people at that point that are get, starting to get scary and dangerous where mm-hmm. we have a better chance out there trying to get away than we do in here with this nut job crowd. Mm-hmm. Because it gets to the point where they, uh, they're they sacrificing people and they're like, yes, and there used to be a blood sacrifice and, and they killed the soldier who who was mildly involved. Like, he he was posted there. He, he wasn't one of the people who were making decisions, but they, they treat him like he was anyway. He was an easy scapegoat. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and one of them stabs him and then they start cheering, you know, stab him, stab him. And it's just, <laughs> it's just outright lunacy. Um, and sadly, this is all very relevant i'm not <laughs> yeah. going to draw parallels with what's going on in the world right now but i feel like some of it is uh is very apt and i think if you uh want to think about it and sort of make those connections yourself i think you'll get there pretty quickly yeah yeah it's unfortunate but yeah you can definitely see the comparisons yeah but i, th- I think that's part of why this movie so I-, I think on a pure entertainment level i love bottle movies where everyone's in one location and they're trying to survive mm. and they're trying to get supplies it's great from that perspective. The monsters are fun. Yeah, like I really like the sort of spider webbing they have, where it's like it's like acid, where it just cuts through. Yeah, like, that one guy who gets like the, the the webbing on his leg, and it just cuts through, and there's just blood like everywhere. It's like, oh man, that's sick. Yeah. But then you have this more serious side where there's actual sort of social commentary and themes and metaphors for what's going on in the world and all that kind of stuff. It's a really great analysis of that, and there's like people try to uh, keep their head. There's the people who are turning to religion, and then there's the people uh, led by his neighbor. Which, by the way, the neighbor character who like comes to comes to the store with Thomas Shane's okay. character uh, is played is played by Andre uh, Brower, uh, who's and I can tell I've not watched this since before Brooklyn Nine Nine started <laughs> because when he went next door and then Captain Holt turned around, I went, "Oh shit, yeah, it's him. He's in this. I'd, I'd forgotten this was him. I really had." <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was uh, it was great seeing him, and you, you kind of forget that he like I love him in Brooklyn Nine Nine, but you know I think you kind of just take it uh, take it for granted that it's like oh yeah he's this kind of you know actor on the sitcom, but he, he is a great actor. Yeah, and he he's he kind of is the the head of the third sort of faction that I'll refer to as the the ones that are so based on logic they refuse to even accept what's happening around them, uh, which ultimately. Uh, you never really quite see what like, where, where they get to, to or like yeah. if they survived or if that worked out. But they 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 leave and go off on their own. They they actually leave the store because they think there's there's nothing to fear. Uh, that said, the baker guy who goes with them, uh, he's not actually leaving. He's just trying to get the shotgun from the one guy's car. Uh, he gets split in half, and which by the way is another great scene. See when because they, they tie mm-hmm. a rope around his waist. <sighs> as yeah, uh, and just, I was, I was explaining what the scene as they tie a rope mm-hmm. around his waist. And he walks out, and they're just sort of feeding him the rope because they because they know they've got three hundred uh, feet of rope, so they're, they're feeding the rope to see how far he gets. And then it, it tenses up, it goes up high, and they're pulling it, and it starts going so fast that their their hands are like ripping, and they have to like, use some shirts and stuff to try and stop their hands from getting cut. And then they pull it in, 
and then eventually it just starts turning red because it's covered in blood and then eventually you see the the, the legs getting dragged in it's just it's perfectly executed perfect and it's it's so funny sometimes what like can really affect you like in, in terms of gore or whatever because like you know you're so used to like i you know you can i can see people get their heads chopped off or get impaled with stuff or get split in half but then sometimes like the things that gross you out the most are just like imagining that rope going through your hands it like oh it, it like irks me out every time it's just so like the noise and just seeing it run through their hands is so unsettling yeah it's a fantastic scene and i, I think some an all-time bit love of the movie is it, is it escalates really perfectly in terms of uh, you know, because we get that before we have some of the main characters venturing outside. And I like that because this is our group of main characters. We don't see what's at the end of that rope. We just see the after effects like they do. It puts us in the same position as the characters. And the movie kind of has that attitude throughout the whole thing. If Thomas Jane, who's the closest thing we have to like a, a main character, he's, like, he's our main protagonist. If he doesn't see something, neither do we. We only see mm. what he sees and hears. Uh so it's not until he goes outside with the others to the pharmacy that we see a bit more. It's not until he and the others eventually get in the car and leave at the end where we see the big guys. Like mm-hmm. It's always from the perspective of our main characters, specifically him, but really the whole little main group of them. And it's kind of great that they're just existing in this world. Like I feel like other you know, directors or movie people or whatever might have tried to be like oh well let's make it about you know the the army guys and let's show what happens when they you know do these experiments or blah 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 like we don't get that like we don't get big explanations or have this kind of like goal-driven plot it's just you know these are characters you know we spend a little time but we get to know them like pretty quickly and yeah. like them and it's just them existing in this world in this situation yeah it's because it's, it's not about any of that it's, it's not about a movie where we see the army try and figure it out or the scene where oh no we've accidentally breached another world like that yeah. can be a good movie like someone else can go oh, and make sure. that movie and that could be great uh but it's about the people try to survive it's about the social commentary mm-hmm. it's about how these people in this little sort of encapsulated version of the world function and how even with a small group of people it still kind of starts to reflect actual like global yeah. debates and kind of stuff like that. <laughs> that that's really what the movie's about uh, so as much as it's fun to hear like oh it was the military and it was project arrowhead and i love that stuff because it's, it's fun little teases it's not yeah. really what the movie's about and yeah it's, it's about these people trying to survive and you mentioned how a lot of the characters aren't that deep but they're really mm-hmm. well executed in that you very quickly get a sense of who each of them are. Uh, yeah. Even if you do, I mean, I couldn't name you any of the characters' names, but I know who every single one of them were. Yeah. If, if that makes sense. Like, I I know oh, yeah, yeah. what role they all play. And, you know, you had, you had the, the checkout girl, you had the checkout uh, boy, the bag boy, Pippa Toby Jones. Uh, checkout girl was uh, Alexa uh, Davalos, who I knew from... Uh, I knew her from Angel, actually. She, she's been on uh, The Man uh, mm-hmm. in the High Castle recently. And uh, I like no one really felt like too much of a stereotype. Like people, you know, could have easily fallen into roles and, and some of them did, but it never felt outlandish or out of character. And uh, I, I did like some of the stuff that kind of subverted your expectations. Like um, I love, you know, the big biker guy when he's about to leave and he, you know, you know, tells uh, Mrs. Carmody, you know, something like, uh, hey, you know, I believe in God too. I just don't think he's the you know, Old Testament wrathful kind of guy like you do. I believe asshole was also used in that sense. So, yeah. <laughs> he's, not, he's not the Old Testament but, asshole that you yeah. talk about. <laughs> but I, I just love that. It's like, oh, like, you know, this isn't the big burly badass biker guy. Like, this is like, he's like, no, like, you know, it, it feels like a real person. You know? Yeah, yeah. There was, there was a few, because even like uh, William Sadler's character, who's kind of like a sort of grunt, you know, kind of, kind of, yeah, because he even at one point even complains, oh, you're Mr. Because uh, Thomas Shane's character is like a, a movie artist. He does posters. He's basically a, a homage to Drew Streisand. Uh, Drew Streisand? Who I think, yeah. Yeah, that's the right who name, I, yeah. Yeah, who I think actually did the the paintings in the beginning, I believe. Uh, makes sense. In fact, he's doing a painting of a Dark Tower movie, which at the time didn't exist. But that's it's that's yeah. such an awesome like little Easter egg for uh, Stephen King fans. Mm. And I'm sure you noticed the uh, the thing posted in the background. 
Oh, I did. Don't you worry. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, which is a, a very good thing to homage with a movie like this yeah. because this... I mean, it's not the exact same, but it's, it's a bottle movie. They're worried about monsters. They're trying to stay safe. There's, there's some definitely some similar elements uh, mm-hmm. in there. And Paranoia does definitely come into play in this movie as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, but no, I, I think, like... So you have William Salas' character who could very easily be this caricature, and he's not. Arguably, the only one who is a caricature is the religious nut, that is Mrs. Carmody. Yeah. Where... But I think that works for her because the type of person who tries to get that following is a caricature. Yeah, definitely. not not to uh, bring up any like, current day <laughs> political figures, but just <laughs> st- just um, in your head, try to think: Is there any right now who are basically a caricature, <laughs> who are basically a cartoon mm. of themselves? Think about it. Jeez, wonder. Think about it. Uh, uh, they exist. They exist. <laughs> Uh, and this 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 feels very much kind of kind of like that. And uh, it, all the other characters again, they're not super deep, but they're all well rounded enough, uh, yeah. and they they all make some degree of sense in how they how they respond to things, uh, mm-hmm. which is and they're, they're all generally again other than Mrs. Camordi, they're all generally pretty likable to in one extent yeah. or another. Because even when uh, William Sadler's character Jim. When he, when he like accidentally gets uh, the young kid killed uh, with the tentacles, oh right! Like afterwards, like him and his buddy look distraught. Like they they realize they messed up. They know they this was their fault, uh, and they try and justify it. And I like that before that as well. When when Thomas Jane's trying to talk them out of it, Toby Jones comes up to him and says, "Look, just let them do this. They they need to feel like they can fix something because they feel yeah. helpless. And being able to fix the generator will make them feel like they've they've got some control back." Um. And I like that little thing. It was almost like telling you, oh, what you're about to watch from here on out is a is a an analysis of human behavior. That's mm-hmm. that's what this is going to be. Uh, so it gave you a little bit of it for free. Like he actually <laughs> just told the audience, this is what this is. They they feel like they, they they're helpless. They're going to fix this so they can feel like they're useful, and we'll go from there. So you, you got a little bit of free analysis to put you on the right sort of you know bread trail, and from there we we are left to figure it out. But uh, let's get it. I, <laughs> I like this movie a lot. Not surprisingly. Yeah. Yeah. So it definitely, you know, stood the test of time. Um, yes, and this is the thing. Even if the CG was like ten times worse than what it actually is, yeah. this movie would still hold up because it's about the characters. Definitely. Because I, 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 we, we recently did the. Uh, well, we recently did the original Mummy, the 1930. 1930- Two right. mummy, but me, me and Connor on in Flux did the 1999 mummy, and some of that CG is dated. I mean, some of it's still okay, but a lot of it has dated quite a bit. But that movie still works really well for what it is because the characters are all really likable and they're fun to watch and interact with each other, and you you have a blast watching it because they're they're fun to be around. Uh, characters, that's what makes movies hold up. <laughs> it's such a uh, such a novel concept. If only more people that made movies would realize that. Michael Bay in particular, he he could probably use a few lessons on this. Yeah. No, don't get me wrong. I'm I, not saying I'm not saying that's the only reason movies hold up, obviously, but mm-hmm. certainly in a movie like this, that this will hold I, up because the actual character drama at the center of it is what makes it so damn good. And then the monsters are really fun on top of it. So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. excellent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any any other scenes you would like to discuss, Tim? Scenes, moments. Uh... Uh, I, I guess we didn't talk too much about the, um, you know, when the uh, probably you know the other kind of big monster attack scene when the the bugs and the kind of pterodactyl looking things attack the store. Um, I guess I don't have much to say about it, but but I thought it was a, a cool scene. It was a um, it was an interesting scene of chaos. Obviously, they, they yeah. used this to sort of build the the religious sort of aura around Mrs. Carmody because the bug lands on her but doesn't doesn't hurt her. It just leaves yeah. her. Uh, which is obviously going to be something that f- helps inspire a few people to maybe see her way of thinking. Um, yeah. But it's just complete chaos. Like, they'll try to set something on fire and they almost <laughs> burn down the store and whatever else. It's, uh, and, it's a hectic scene. I forget if it was after or before that, um, but the the scene where... Um, I, I forget the character's name, but the one like lady overdoses on pills... And they think she's kind of just like sleeping on the floor, and, uh, and you know it's just like a really like somber, like quiet 
sad scene. And it's just so weird that it's like, you know, in another movie, it would be like a really big, like, um, important thing. I, I feel like to center around, it's, but yeah, this, it's, it's like, there's so much going on. It's like, all right, this is just another thing that happened. We can't really worry about it too much it, right it, now. It's a quiet little moment, but it, it comes at the right point in the movie where, you know, okay, this is how bad this is. Some of these characters are going to start wanting to commit suicide. Yeah. It's basically what that's saying. And then we find out that the other two soldiers, uh, oh, right. hang themselves in the back. So at, at this point, we're like, okay, these people are really starting to like, lose it like they're, they're at the end of the rope they think they're they think they're done and there's no hope left which ultimately is something i want to get to about how, what this movie ultimately is <laughs> uh because you talked about being hopeless and I, I agree it is and i think actually as much as you think oh green mile goes with shawshank as a sort of companion because they're both prison movies and they're both this and that i actually think this goes with shawshank more than green mile does because shawshank yeah is about having hope no matter what and how mm. hope can prevail. In fact, you know, the, the, the famous quote from the movie is, uh, fear can hold you prisoner, hope can set you free. Mm. Okay. Whereas here, this movie is about losing hope because that ending happens because Tommy Strain and the other characters lose hope. Mm. And, Interesting. Then when, <laughs> and, and when they give up, the worst possible thing happens. <laughs> like, literally, like, there's, there's nothing worse yeah. that could have happened at the end. That's really interesting. I never made that uh, comparison before, but yeah, that's a <laughs> neat little parallel. And, I, and I'm obviously I'm not blaming the characters for losing hope. I mean, if I went through oh, this, yeah. I'd, I'd have probably <laughs> given up way before now. But it's it's kind of the idea that the, the difference between the two is, in one, the, the character never gives up hope no matter what, uh, and he inspires hope in others. Where whereas here, the, the main characters try to keep hope as long mm. as they can. But everyone else around them is t- try to strip it away, and eventually it kind of works. And it's not really them; it's the, it's the more the monsters in the situation as a whole. But eventually, hope does get stripped away, and mm. when you lose hope, all bets are off. In fact, because even in the social commentary part of the movie, inside the inside the store, it's when other characters lose hope that they turn to the nut job, that they turn yeah. to the the cultly antics and this mob mentality. Uh, so no, I, I think I think it's a I think it's a great movie. It's yeah. great for now, a multitude of reasons. Um, and two quick things uh, I want to mention before we get to our uh, scores. Um, one, uh, I want to get your thoughts on this because I, I this is a complaint I've heard people have before, where they say that you know after he shoots everyone at mm. the end, um, that like the army shows up too quickly after that. Um, Piss do you off. think, <laughs> what do you want? Do you want, do you want the scene to go on for about five minutes before the, the tank rolls in? Well, I always kind of thought that they might be playing with time a little bit. Like, yeah. Cause I, I don't know if like uh, that we're supposed to believe that it's like literally like, you know, two seconds later, the thing shows up. I kind of imagined that, you know he stews for a, a little bit I, and I, I never yeah did. like you can't really show like that much time i i never did because I, I don't think this needs an explanation i think that is such a nitpick like who cares like yeah. it, it, in fact if anything it hurts it by saying that there is more time that we don't see because th- that's what makes it such a gut punch it's literally seconds you know it's, it's, it's a minute tops had they just waited one more minute yeah that's all it would have taken that actually makes the ending stronger. So, no, no, stupid complaint. Kick that one out of the park. <laughs> Next. Okay. Yeah, I was just interested. Uh, I, I feel like I don't hear that many people bring it up, but I feel like it was something when the movie first came up. I heard people complain about that. But uh, second thing that I want to ask you is, uh, when you're rewatching it, were you rewatching it in black and white, or? That's a good question. Because uh, yeah. if you if you're on the Blu-ray, you have the option because they mm-hmm. they provide both. Uh, obviously, it was released in color, but. Uh, the director did want it to be in black and white. They didn't let him release it that way, but it is on the Blu-ray if you want to experience it. Kind of like how Mad Max uh, Fury Road's getting a, a black and white version. Um, or Logan. Or Logan, yeah, that's another one. Uh, I have seen it both ways, and I tend to flip-flop between mm. which one I'm which one i using. I, I watched it in black and white this time. Okay. And it does suit the film well. And honestly, uh, it does actually help the CG a bit as well. It's it's less oh, obvious when it's in black and white. 
Oh, cool. And given what it's homaging to, given that it does have that Night of the Living Dead feel, the black and white actually works really well. Uh, it it complements the film. Yeah, um, I enjoy the black and white quite a bit. Uh, I watched it in color this time. Um, I, mm. I, I think it's... Uh, is I think it's just um, yeah similar like the last time I watched it I think it was in black and white so I was like I'll do color this time since it had been a while since uh, I watched it but um, yeah depending on the mood I am I, I might go either way but it, it looks good in it uh, so yeah I guess I guess that leads to ratings right. Timothy and you know before I rewatch it I'd probably. I still liked it, but I'd probably, you know, uh, give it a little bit of lower score. But after watching it and, uh, and and just talking about it, it kind of made me excited. It almost makes me want to watch it again. Uh, I'm actually going to give it a pretty high score and give it a, a solid 9. Hmm. I, I am also going to give it a solid 9, although I was already pretty sure I was giving it a 9 before we watched it because... Um, I think... I, yeah, I, like before I was thinking like 8, 8.5 maybe, and then... Yeah, it was just a surprise. Like, you know what? That's, yeah, it, it's still really good. Mm. It completely holds up. Uh, there's mm. there's really nothing about it that feels... It, it, like, watching it again 10 years later, there was nothing about mm. it that felt like, oh, that was a weird concept that didn't work, or that scene yeah. felt kind of stupid, or, like, everything about it works. It's, it's, it's a great movie, so... Yeah. Uh, also, but, like... I don't know about you, but sometimes I tend not to trust, like, my past self. Like, you know, sometimes I go, like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I trust I, past Tim's opinion. I completely agree. I do not trust your past <laughs> self either. <laughs> I mean, if you're going, you know, further than three or four years back, hmm. I might have some dodgy <laughs> ideas. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you have. Hell, I'm pretty sure about a week ago you had some dodgy ideas. <laughs> I'll never regret that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, so, no, no, 9 out of 10 for me as well. I uh, I, I think it's a... I, I think it's a modern classic, uh, to put it back. And, hey, and why is it a modern classic? Because it was directed by the guy who did Shawshank Redemption, which is also a goddamn classic. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. So it shouldn't be a surprise that it's this goddamn good, but it the is. The guy that wrote Nightmare on Elm Street three, which is the best Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> well, that's debatable, but <laughs> it's a very good one. We've not done them yet. Uh, that that'll be something that that will not be happening this year. We have franchise plans coming later on. Some mm -hmm. marathons for October. Don't you worry. There's uh, goodies. Goodies abound. Um, but Nightmare we can maybe save for next year. So. Ooh excited but yeah that's the mist so let us know what you think of the movie in the comments below like subscribe all that stuff helps us out a lot it can also help us out of course being over to patreon.com slash mailfuzz tv uh, check out some of the bonuses over there one of which of course is the the vote uh which you have until the end of the month to vote for the next month's bonus movie uh we have a summer theme right now on the vote for the patrons uh, so check it out make sure you get your vote in before the end of the month uh, last month's winner is still coming. We, <laughs> we, we should have had it recorded already, uh, but that also got delayed because of the technical issues. Because we were going to record this and that movie back to back on Tuesday, did not happen due to unforeseen technical faults. Uh, it Leave should, the lawnmower, man. It should be coming at the end of this week. Uh, it shouldn't typically be this close to the end of the month. It should usually be earlier. But as I said, Tim was on vacation. Then we had technical faults, so. And hey, uh, it's still in the month, so back off, Jack. What do you want from us? True, true. It's still in the month. We, we technically <laughs> are hitting the deadline. Uh, so, but no, check that out. And that is us. So, uh, thank you very much for watching. We will see you again soon. Because this was late, uh, it shouldn't be too long before the next one's up. And mm -hmm. uh, look out for the TV review of the first mm -hmm. episode of the Miss TV show. I have no idea how they're going to turn this into a TV show, but we're going to find out soon. So... Thank you very much for watching, guys. We'll see you next time. Keep watching scary movies. Goodbye.